look at my watch to see whether I should say afternoon or morning because it's nine o'clock in uh, California. And thank you for that nice intro. I sound great. <laughs> um, I am happy to be here today. Um, I love Atlanta. I lived here for 11 years and just moved to California and I love California too. And um, I have Kim Day, who is your colleague and my good friend, to thank for being here today. And so I'm happy to be here and start my new year at the Skank School. This is my first presentation of the year. So I'll try not to fall. Um, so I'm gonna talk about teaching African-American children to read. And um, I'm really gonna talk about language variation and talk about some of our practices and some of the things that we're doing in schools that support and some that um, don't support uh, the development of reading in African-American kids. And so um, the impact of language variation is a concern everywhere in the world. And certainly I learned a lot about it by being in the South because um, this is quite a, a varied linguistic environment. So what is language variation? We also call them dialects. And we're trying to, um, we're in this phase that we often get into in um, academics where we are seeing a shift in our terminology, where we are working on changing some of our terminology so that it better reflects what it is that we're talking about and gets away from some of the baggage that gets attached to some words. And dialects are certainly absolutely legitimate, but one of the things about dialects that we find is that because they are considered subsystems of a major language, people treat them like subsystems. And so we're moving away from calling them dialects, but that's what they are, and talking about language variation. So language variation is um, languages or linguistic systems spoken by members of a community that may be united by race, by ethnicity, or by the region of the country. And so some examples of that are, of course, in Georgia, Southern English is the big one. Um, so united by region. Uh, Chicano English, or Chicana English, which is um, the English used by Mexicans that people often call Spanglish. And now that I'm in California, it's on my list. Uh, it wasn't before. <laughs> African American English, uh, Appalachian English, and so all these variations of English that are impacted by who you are and where you live. I started talking about this because of some of the negative connotations around dialects. So dialects are rule-governed language systems. You're gonna hear me say that a lot today. That's one of the most important things about language variation. The variation is rule-governed, it's not random. It is rule-governed, and as scientists, we, ought, we know what the rules are, and frankly, as listeners and speakers, you also know what the rules are. Even if you can't state them explicitly, if you hear somebody talk about them, you're like, oh yeah, I know that. And so they're um, rule governed. They are derived from major languages. So I've gotten to the point, especially now that I'm in California and there's so much linguistic variation, when somebody says English, I change it. It's American English. It's not British English. It's not Australian English. It's not New Zealand English, it's American English. So there are different varieties of English overall, and then within those Englishes, there are also vari variants. And Englishes is actually a word I didn't use until I got to California, where people were talking about, especially in the schools, all these different varieties of English that are impacted by all of these different uh, backgrounds of their students, so there are many, varieties of English. Um, and they are present in every country in the world. One of the things I've learned when I travel is the more languages there are, the more dialects there are. And so you go someplace like India, there are so many dialects in India. And the impact of those dialects on reading and writing across the world is very similar. What dialects are not, they are not bad grammar which is something we hear a lot in schools, that when you see kids who are doing things that differ from whatever you consider to be general American English, those differences are not bad grammar. 
they are grammar that is appropriate for the language system that the child in their community speak, okay? And when they come to school, they're learning the grammar of the language system that's used in school. School is a separate language context. It is not the end-all, be-all language context. It's just a different one. So kids are learning to use language in many different contexts, and school is one of them. Um, dialects are not slang, and they're not incorrect or undesirable. And that's really important to say. I mean, most of us in this room are working with younger kids, kids in elementary, middle, and high school. When I was at Georgia State and I had interactions with undergraduates, they taught me what the consequences are of treating their language systems like they're incorrect or undesirable. They are now in college. They are 21, 22, 23 years old. And when I talk to them about language variation and I talk about what the rules are, what it is, how it works, the very first comment I got the first time I did this with, student, with students at Georgia State was, I didn't know how I talked was a thing. I just thought it was wrong. And I said, why? And then she talked to me about all the practices in her school where they, you know, you need to stop talking like that. That's bad grammar. You need to do this. Then the other students chimed in. Then I watched a young lady who, she was, she was a senior, and she wanted to ask me a question. And she started to ask the question, and I'm a speech pathologist, right? So I pay attention to everything on your face. And so her, I could see the tension in her forehead and in her neck. And I said, what are you doing? Can you tell me what you're doing? Because I see a lot of tension. She was trying to code switch. So she was using all this cognitive energy to think about the words that she was going to use to make sure they were right. That is a concern for a college student, but for a younger student to take all of your resources, the resources that you should be using to learn to read, write, and socialize in a school environment, to try to figure out how to be correct means that you're missing a lot of things. And that's one of the things that we're finding, is that when students are using their cognitive resources to try to assimilate, they're um, giving up those resources that they could be using to actually learn to read. And so the students at Georgia State, it broke my heart, but they taught me so much about the consequences of all this. Dialects impact all domains of language. I won't spend time on this because everybody knows these domains, right? There are five of them. And all of them are impacted by the dialect you speak because dialects are cultural. Um, your variation depends on the background you come from. Even when it's regional, the South has a culture that impacts its, how language is used. And everyone in the United States speaks a dialect. People think that unless you have a southern accent or you say y'all, which is one of my favorite words, um, if, unless you say y'all or, or I might could do something, that you don't speak a dialect. Yes, you do. Everybody speaks a dialect. This is the ugliest map I've ever seen because of the colors. But <laughs> this is a traditional linguistic map. And so it is split up in dialects around the country. Every single state in the country has its own language practices. And so um, I'm from, originally from Seattle, and so we have the Pacific Northwest dialect. We do all kinds of interesting things with language. I notice them more now that I study language and I listen to my nephews and I'm like, that's funny. But um, we have Pacific Northwest. I live in California and Northern and Southern California have different dialects. They use different vocabulary. They use language very differently. Then when you move to, so we have by regions, we see it by state, but then you also see in our maps that some cities have their own dialect that's different from the rest of the state. For example, like New York City um, is very different. Louisiana is so much. It's just so much. And, <laughs> And there is a professor, um, Walt Walfram, at the University of North Carolina who studies the um, dialect in North Carolina, and it is split up into six regions. And there are all these different systems, and he's like, he wrote a book that said North Carolina is like dialect heaven. 
And for somebody who is a dialectologist, being in the South introduces you to all these different languages, all these different dialects like Gullah. Um, and we have Ocracoke, which people speak on the island. So there are all these language systems that people are using around the country. It's American English variants. So they vary by who you are. Chicago is really interesting. Somebody's from Chicago. Who's from Chicago? Yes. So when I, I was at the University of Wisconsin, and I had some data from um, a colleague at Northwestern. And she sent me these tapes. And I was listening to these tapes of kids. And I was, kept saying, these kids sound like Southerners. And I had a um, postdoc who came in, and she was from Chicago. She walked into the room, and she said, oh, those kids are from Chicago. And I said, how do you know that? And she said, they sound like they're from Chicago. I was like, that's not helpful. But um, I went back and started looking at them, and it turns out that Chicago has its own dialect because the great migration in the 1930s, most people in Chicago came from Mississippi, black people, and then they were segregated. So they live in these communities. Chicago's the most segregated city in the country. So black people in Chicago moved into these segregated communities and they maintain the southern vowels. That's what makes Chicago black English different. So that's why the kids all sound like southerners. Because everybody else, when my parents left Texas and moved to Seattle, they lost those vowels. And they lost a lot of their southernisms. But in Chicago, they were maintained because of the isolation in the neighborhoods. So Chicago has developed its own language or variation in the city and the black variant is even different than the white variant. And so it's really interesting, the patterns all over the country, but there isn't a person in this room who does not speak a dialect. Not one. Everybody. So, languages are rule-governed symbol systems. I'm gonna talk about the difference between languages and dialects. Languages are rule-governed symbol systems in which words are produced to represent actions and objects in finite combinations. So you can't do everything in a language. There are rules for how language is used, and we talk about that as being grammatical or ungrammatical. There are ways, there are rules for how words are put together. How many people in here play Wordle? <laughs> Everybody. Everybody plays Wordle. <laughs> And the ability to play Wordle is based on your implicit knowledge of how words are formed. So when you see a word and you put letters up there and you have the letter W, you know what can follow W. It can't be Z, it can't be T, it can't be a lot of things. That's your knowledge of the finite combinations in our language. You may not know what they are explicitly, but implicitly you do and that's what allows you to play that addictive game, and many word games. It's an innate skill that's learned by members of a speech community. Innate is important because that's different from reading. Reading is not innate, it's taught. When you're born, you're wired to use language, and you will use it unless you're impaired, typically. Even when you're not consistently um, exposed to a language, you will use language in some way. You will communicate in some way. It can be verbal or nonverbal. Nonverbal, of course, is sign language. It's considered a nonverbal language system. So is mathematics. So those are nonverbal systems of communication. And the important thing for both languages and dialects is that they are agreed upon by a community of speakers. So we use language the way we do because we say we do. And we say it's acceptable. We know what we believe to be acceptable in the use of language, and we have agreed on it, and when people violate it, we're not nice. We're not nice. Nobody is, it's not just the United States. And what's a dialect? It is a language variety used by different people in specific regions, social, cultural groups. And so language versus dialect, the dialect is derived from the language, so it's the language variety. African-American English is what I'm going to talk about today. It's been called a lot of things. Um, Bill called it African-American vernacular English. I do not use vernacular because I think it has um, some 
I don't think the assumptions are met about it being a vernacular, because I think for some people, it really functions like a language, and the vernacular suggests that it doesn't. And so theoretically, I don't think we've proven that it's a vernacular, so I don't use it. A lot of people do, though. So I call it AAE. Some people call it AAVE or AVE. Um, it, it has, the name has changed over time, and w whatever we're called, that's what the dialect is called. It used to be called Negro Non-Standard English. We didn't like that one. Then it became Black English. When we became African American, it's African American English. So it's changed over time. And the one thing that we heard it called in the press was Ebonics, yes. Ebonics is a trade way of talking about this. You will never see it in um, articles. So it's not a scientific way. But there was a guy, I think his name was Robert Taylor, he wrote a book, called it Ebonics, and talked about the language in the community. But I say that to say these are all the same linguistic system by different names. They're all the same. It is a systematic rule-governed variation. Remember, rule-governed is really important. Um, it's used by most, but not all, African Americans. Just because you're black doesn't mean you speak African American English. And in fact, one of the problems with that for us, I'm a speech pathologist, is if you hear an African-American child who's using language differently, it could be an impairment. It's not necessarily just dialect, so not everybody speaks it. Um, many of us do, though. It developed as an oral language with no written counterpart. This is not a written system. It's an oral system. Most dialects are oral systems, but you're a teacher, so you see it in writing. It's because we write the way we talk. So if you say whiff, then you're gonna spell it how? W-I-F, that's why you see it in writing, but it has not been codified for writing. The other place you see it in writing is in novels, like Toni Morrison used it a lot, so does Alice Walker. But if you notice in a novel, whenever you see dialect, it's in quotation marks. So it's a speaker, so it's really just oral language on paper. What you don't see is the sentence leading up to it written in dialect. So it still hasn't been codified for writing. It's an oral language system. And the last bullet is really important. It's a low prestige dialect. And um, it's used in communities and homes and not often spoken at school. So this is a place where I stop and talk about prestige because prestige matters. Um, we talk about dialects as low prestige or high prestige. A high prestige variety is one where when you hear people speak it, you attribute positive characteristics to the speaker. A low prestige variety is one where when you hear someone speak it, you attribute negative characteristics to the speaker. So what's an example of a high prestige variety of English? British English, that's the first one people say. You can be dumb, but if you have a British English, <laughs> British accent, <laughs> people think you're related to the queen, you're high class, and you drink tea with your pinky up. And so that's a high prestige variety. It's the one people always come up with. But within high prestige varieties, there are also low prestige. So there's British English and then there's Cockney English, which is used by the lower class. And that's considered lower prestige. What's a high prestige variety in the United States? What is? Yes. So people think that that broadcast style is higher prestige. The other one people think is high prestige is Boston. Boston is often, often the one that people talk about. But it is, how many people said Boston? But it is not the Boston of the inner city. It's the Boston of the Kennedys that people consider high prestige. So they're like our royalty, you know, scandal driven and high prestige. Uh, and so we think about that as being a high prestige variety. And we think positive things about people when we hear it. What's a low prestige variety? Southern English, absolutely. Everywhere I go, that's the answer to low prestige, except Texas. Texas is like, <laughs> yeah, they said, when I said what's a low prestige variety, they said the way they talk in Louisiana and Arkansas and Georgia, I said, oh, not Texas? And so, but most people say Southern English because when people hear a Southern accent, 
and they hear Southern isms, what do they think about the speaker? Slow, redneck, uneducated. We could go on and on, but we won't. But you see that it's really low prestige and it's not fair to the speakers. When I was a student at the University of Michigan, um, we had a new reading researcher come to the university. I'm not going to mention her name, but <laughs> she was very prominent. And my advisor said, oh, you should go talk to her and think about having her on your committee. So I made a, an appointment with her. I went to meet with her. And I'm telling you, when I heard that Alabama accent, I was like, oh, hell no. <laughs> no. I was like, she's racist. She's redneck. All this negative stuff. I don't even know this lady. And she turned out to be one of my best committee members. But when I met her, I was like, oh, no, absolutely not. And so it's this, um, these characteristics. We conflate the way you talk with who you are. And that can be problematic if you're speaking a low prestige variety, okay? And so somebody said, when I said low prestige variety, African American English, it is a low prestige variety. That's why I bring this up. So if you are a boy, an African American boy, you are 12 years old, you are using all of these language forms that are so different and accepted in your community and in your social group, what do people think about those boys, especially boys? Thug, that's the one. Thug, what else? Criminal, same thing. Not necessarily. Yeah, not smart, not motivated. So when people judge you by the way that you talk, it can be positive or negative. When it's positive, it can be problematic, but not always. When it's negative, it's always problematic. And so the low prestige of this variety um, has really influenced how we have been w willing to accept it in schools and in other environments. So what does it do to English? This is African American English. So I'm just giving you a few features, not all of them. These are the major ones. It adds and deletes morphemes, which is important when you're thinking about teaching reading. So zero possessive, it deletes all the S's. The plural, the third person singular, and the possessive are all variably included. That's what we call it. So sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not. It depends on the context. That's what makes it a dialect. And so the, those are variably included, and so is the past tense ED. And these are examples that I got from kids who worked in my projects. It transforms the main verb in the verb phrase. These top two are the most common features of African American English, regardless of socioeconomic status. Deletion of forms of the verb to be, the copula and the auxiliary. The copula is the main verb, and the auxiliary is the helping verb. So he is hungry becomes he hungry. He running fast instead of he is running fast. Okay, And you see it's also affecting phonology, which I changed, so the G is dropped. Subject verb agreement was and were are really commonly switched. So they was looking for something instead of they were looking for it. And then habitual be. I love this one. It is <laughs> the infinitive form of the verb to be regardless of the subject. So you can say he be, she be, they be, the dog be, anybody be. <laughs> the thing that's important about it is the time aspect. It's habitual. So this is not just is. It's not just a substitution for is and are. When you see somebody be doing something, you should be able to put at the end of the sentence all the time. <laughs> Habitual. So this doesn't mean he's getting some ice cream today. It means he be getting some ice cream all the time. He always be eating ice cream. That's what it means. So it's a time marker. And we see a lot of these in African American English, including remote past, remote past been, which Southerners will recognize because it is also Southern. I've been knowing how to do something. That means I, knew, I didn't just learn that yesterday. I've been knowing how to do that. And so these are time markers that, um, in the verb phrase. And um, remote past been, you also see in the South in Southern speakers. And African-American English has its roots in the South because African-American people have their roots in the South. So we took the Southern dialect 
the cultural dialect, combined them, moved out of the South, and took them with us wherever we went. And so I come from Seattle. You will hear it in Seattle. You will hear it in Maine. You will hear it in the middle of the country. Anywhere we are as a community, you will hear these um, features of African American English. It also impacts phonology, which is also important for reading. So the top one, really common, F, F for theta, which is the voiceless TH, with for with, V for the voice TH, bathe and bathing instead of bathe and bathing, wit for with, so the T in the intervocalic positions. And then D for the voice TH, in pre-vocalic position, so at the beginning of a word, dis, dat, dem, dos is really common. And then consonant cluster reduction is really interesting, one that we're really interested in, and I'll show you an example of it. Because when you delete, when there are consonant clusters at the end of a word, you can delete the last, the last sound. So it's final consonant deletion, it's also called. Really, really common here because you also hear it in Southern English. So when you see black kids in the South, there is not a final consonant in sight because it can be deleted in both systems. And final consonant deletion is interesting because if we delete the D from cold, it produces the word coal, which is a real word. And so where final consonants are deleted and create different words, we are interested in whether that slows kids down. I don't think it changes your comprehension, but I think it really can slow you down while you're trying to figure out which word it is. And that's something we're really interested in. There are also some features that I call other. That to me, they're like the fun ones. So the first one is fitna supposed to bow to. I'm fitting to go do something. What is fitna? It's fixing to. I'm fitting to go outside, I'm supposed to go outside, I'm about to go outside. That means I'm getting ready to do that right now. I'm fitting to do it now. Imminent action is what it, what it is called. Multiple negation. Now one of the things we did with African American English and kids is we, caught a, we um, found the features for kids. Because when I first started publishing, people, the reviewers would write back, this is an incomplete list. It doesn't include this, this, and this. And I was like, but that's not developmental. Kids don't do that. Adults do. And so one of the things we did was find out what the features are for kids, not for adults. Because adults do different things than kids do. And frankly, old people do different things than young people do. Um, um, John Rickford and John Baugh, who were at Stanford, call it age grading. So there are some things my grandmother did I would never do like men's and women's, right? That's an old people thing. <laughs> Young people would never call somebody men's. I saw the men's, that's old. So <laughs> I said all that because multiple negation used to be double negation. Two negatives in a sentence. Till we started working with kids and we figured out if you can get six negatives in a sentence, you should go for it. And the <laughs> And the more negatives you have, the more negative it is. He ain't never got no money, no how. That means he is broke. And so that's what we learned from kids, that they do some other things with African American English that, that you don't always see in adults. And then there's the double modal, which in the South is might could, right? But in kids, unless you are a child who grew up in the South, this was in Michigan. You see Mike could and really young kids here. But in Michigan and the Midwest where kids are speaking African American English but not Southern English, they, speak develop, they use developmental forms of double modals. So I'm am doing something instead of I might could. I'm am doing it, okay? So that's a child feature. So these are the other things kids are doing. So there are things that go into these major categories and then there are some other things that we hear all the time and we know that kids are doing those. One of the things about African American English, we've heard it, um, people talk about it different ways. Like Geneva Smitherman, who is at Michigan State, she's a professor emeritus now. She wrote a book called Talking and Testifying back in the 70s, where she talked about how black people get together and like roast each other, just like dog each other, and use language to do it. But one of the things that's different about the way she talks about dialect is she considers slang to be African-American English. I do not. 
anything that's dated can become dated. We don't talk about as part of the dialect. It may be what African American um, people are doing with words, but it'll go away, like jive or fat, P H A T. That's slang. Dialects are not dated, but slang is. So that's a difference in the way some of us talk about this. The things we've learned about dialect, low-income kids use more dialect than middle-income kids overall. That low-income kids are more likely to be using it about 99% of the time. Boys use a lot more than girls. We saw that as young as kindergarten. And we continue to see that as boys get older. And we don't really know why. Um, in the literature, they talk about, um, like in British English, that men use more dialect of British English than women do, but they attribute it to work environments. That doesn't explain kids. So if you're doing that as young as five, it has to have something to do with being positive from a masculine standpoint. And so we hear little boys do this all the time, a lot more than girls. At school entry, we found that low-income preschoolers who use the most dialect are also the most advanced language users. So they really know the language of their community, which means they know language well. But as soon as they get to school, that advantage disappears. And so our expectation is, when you see a kid who's a really strong language user, that should translate to a strong reader. But that's not what we see with African American kids. And that has more to do with us than it does do with them. And so something happens when they get to school because of this low prestige variety that they're bringing with them and using it a lot. Those kids, we do not see it being an advantage for them, even though from a linguistic standpoint, they're quite sophisticated language users. We also see in older kids, even when kids are using, we call it general American English, it says um, mainstream American English, 92% of African-American fourth graders who are reading general American English are reading it with dialect. And so are their parents. You read the way you talk. If you use African-American English all the time in your oral language, you are not reading text word for word. You're reading it the way that you use language. So 92% of kids were using African, and this is using the great oral reading test, so we listen to them read aloud. But what we found was that students improve their accuracy because they know you want them to read in general American English. So they improve their accuracy by slowing down their rate and spending more time trying to get that word right. But then when we get to the end, like that last paragraph where you are getting ready to, you know, flame, flame out, this is it for you. Then we see kids, because the syntax has getting, gotten harder, the vocabulary has gotten more sophisticated, they use more dialect in that last paragraph. So you have gotta give something up. The cognitive load represented by trying to hold on to this language system that you don't actually use in oral language while you're trying to read gets to be too much when you get to a really hard paragraph. They get to the hard paragraph, they stop trying to read it in general American English, have a whole bunch of dialect in it. Is that a problem? No, because what we know is they're trying to get the meaning from the text. And if I'm gonna get the meaning from this one, I can't be focused on that other stuff. The problem for us is that when we do standardized testing and we look at how good you are as a reader, accuracy and rate, are the two things we look at. And what we find with African American kids reading general American English text is they slow down and they use more dialect. So they, not, they don't have good rate or accuracy. And so then we say, when we score the test, these kids don't read well. Sure they do. The test disadvantages them. One of the things that we talked about earlier when I was just talking to the um, teachers here, and from Price and Slate, Slater, is that a lot of the instruments that we use help us to figure out how African American kids perform, but it doesn't tell us anything about their competency. So when kids are doing this, they're having trouble with the test, and we think it's because they can't read. And a lot of times they actually do read well, but in order to get through this test, 
I have to slow down and give some stuff up. And so it makes it look like they're less capable than they are. So we're working on some of those kinds of things with our instruments because we're learning more about what African-American kids can't do than we are about what they actually can do when we use these instruments. Why do we care? We care about this because students who don't learn the language of school by the end of third grade are a grade level or more behind by the time they get to fourth and fifth grade. We all know in this room, language and reading are inextricably tied. Language and writing are inextricably tied. And so if you have not learned the language of print, by the time you get to a certain age, you will have difficulty with reading and writing. So, AAE reading and writing. Okay, this is a slide that I used before the pandemic. Because it was abysmal, abysmal enough. And now we're gonna talk about the pandemic and what happened. So the majority of African-American fourth graders, and this is on the National Assessment of Education Progress, which is often called the nation's report card. 81% of African-American fourth graders were reading at a basic level or below, which means that only 19%, fewer than 20% were considered proficient or advanced readers. So eight out of 10 African-American kids were struggling with reading before the pandemic in fourth grade. So what happened during the pandemic? So post-pandemic, what happened? So here's the NAEP, poverty status. We know that matters, right? So if you look at the change in points, percentage points, actually I think this is just points for kids, those eligible for the National School Lunch Program did more poorly than kids who were not eligible. So poor kids were really impacted by the pandemic. Not good, doesn't look so bad though, right? We got work to do to get their scores up. So this is the 2020 score, there's the 2022 score. Then we look at it by race. Kids who were American Indian or Alaska Native dropped by like a point, not so bad. Asian kids didn't drop at all. They looked the same before and after the pandemic. Asian, I mean black, Hispanic, and white kids, six points, all of them, equally impacted by the pandemic, right? No. So one of the things about these data is you have to keep unpacking them until something is really informative. What it tells us is that all of these kids struggled during the pandemic and we saw their reading scores really decrease because of the pandemic. But it turns out that the best predictor of how much you were impacted by the pandemic was how you were performing before the pandemic. And that is this one. Look at the kids in the bottom quartile compared to the kids in the top. 90th percentile, you were doing well, you lost a bit, but not as much as this guy who wasn't doing well at all and lost so much during the pandemic. The kids at the 25th, so much. So the lower your scores were, the lower your performance was before the pandemic, the more the pandemic impacted your overall reading ability. And so this, is interesting and it is informative and it should be influencing what we do, but it's not. Because we never let our data influence what we do. Why would we do that? <laughs> because what it suggests is that we should be targeting the kids who were having the most problem before the pandemic. Everybody needs to catch up. We're gonna get kids caught up, but the kids who need the most attention in terms of getting caught up because they lost so much during the pandemic were the kids who weren't doing well before the pandemic the kids who were in the lowest quartiles. And so we have a lot of work to do with those kids. Are they gonna catch up? Well, they never caught up before. I mean, they were behind most of the time. But we still have to get them to a point where they're reading at a level where, you know, I don't know if it's grade level, I don't even know what we're shooting for. Because if you think about the pandemic, we had these kids who left us as first graders and came back as third graders. So are we trying to make them grade level fourth graders? What are we doing? I, I don't know, I wish I could answer that question, I'm just asking it. But 
I don't know. But I know that this is really informative for us, that these kids who were performing very poorly lost so much and that they need a lot more attention, intentional attention to their reading skills. Math looks way worse than reading. Math looks bad for everybody, but it looks even worse for those kids in the bottom quartile. I think most of the country lost an average of 10 points in math, so math was really impacted. So for African-American children, we knew before the pandemic that for every year that these kids were in school, their achievement decreased um, by a tenth of a standard deviation until it just accumulates. And we see kids getting further and further behind by the time they're in high school. So the longer they're in school, the greater the gap seems to be. What matters for this? That's what I want to talk about. Three important factors for influencing reading and writing in African American children. One is the oral written language mismatch. Two, dialect density. Three, the cognitive load. And then we'll go on, and what are, uh, there are lots of other ones, but those are the three that I've identified and we'll talk about today. So this is the mismatch hypothesis. Somehow the site dropped off, but this is Johnson 1969. So we said in 1969, is that 50 years ago? Yeah, something like that. Um, it has been hypothesized that the mismatch between the language system spoken at home and the one used at school increases the cognitive load for kids and, who speak other languages or dialects and makes reading harder to learn. So the process of learning to read is harder because of this mismatch between the oral and written system. And um, what time am I supposed to stop? Now? Oh. <laughs> so, um, so I want to give this example that really taught me about this and about cognitive load. When I was a new assistant professor at the University of Michigan, there was a little girl who was participating in a study that I was doing. She was four years old. She was homeless. It was a story retail study. So I read a book to her, and then she had the book in front of her, so she had the pictures. Tell the story back to me, right? The book was Are You My Mother? Every, who knows Are You My Mother? All teachers do. It's by P.D. Eastman, and the idea is that this baby bird hatches from the egg, and the mother's not there. And the bird looks around and says, where's my mother? So it jumps out of the nest and goes to different objects, animals, and things, and says, are you my mother? And the response is, I am not your mother. I am a chicken, for example. So this is the way this whole book goes. So I read it to this little girl. She loved the story, eager to read it back to me. So she's retelling it. So I put the book in front of her. She opened the page, and she looked at me and said, is you my mama? I ain't none of your mama. <laughs> and she read the whole book that way. And she went through, we had so much fun. She did the whole book, she used the pictures, but she used that refrain the whole way through and talked about the book using African-American English. And so I walked away from there tickled. It was so much fun, but then I thought about what it took for her to listen to a book in a language variety that she didn't speak, hold on to the elements of the story and tell it back to me. So it was taxing her vocabulary, her working memory, all of it. She had the language skills to pull it off. A lot of our kids do not. They are not pulling this off. This is a lot of work to listen to something in one system, basically translate it back to the system that you use, and then repeat it. And so she was the child who taught me how hard this must be and about this mismatch issue. And we talked about the mismatch hypothesis for years. This is what's driving the problems that we're seeing with reading, but we couldn't prove it. Until I went to the University of Wisconsin, where I froze for four years and left. <laughs> and, but the great thing that happened to me at Wisconsin was that I started working with Mark Seidenberg. And Mark and I do a lot of work together. And, <clears throat> excuse me, Mark, people think of Mark, you know, as a reading person, but he also does a lot of computational modeling. And so I said, Mark, can we prove or disprove the, um, the mismatch hypothesis using computational modeling? He said yes. So he created this model where the input and the output either matched or they didn't. So it was spelling and pronunciation. 
And so sometimes the spelling and the pronunciation matched, sometimes they didn't. And just briefly what we found was that if the spelling and the pronunciation matched, it took the model approximately 300 trials to get to 75% mastery. If the pronunciation and the spelling didn't match, it took the model more than 1,000 trials to get to 75% mastery. So it took three times as many trials to get to the same outcome when they were mismatched. And so we were finally able to prove that this is what we think happens to kids. They need more time, they need more trials, they need more experience with this system that we want them to use in school in order to get good at it and in order to rectify the differences between the two. And in the absence of that, they don't learn it and struggle with reading. So the mismatch hypothesis was really important and it turns out that it's true. But then there's the cognitive load, the amount of information that your working memory can hold at any given time. That's the cognitive load. That's what we saw on the GORT. Cognitive load was great for those kids. And so they were um, giving up rate or accuracy in order to handle the load. Now this little girl who was four, I'm certain this was a heavy cognitive load for her, but she's having a great time and she did a good job at it. And a lot of our kids just don't do that. And so working memory has limited capacity. So when you overload it with all these additional activities that don't really contribute to kids learning to read, then there's not a lot left for reading. So it's, there's the mismatch, but it's not just the mismatch. There's the cognitive load, but then there's the magnitude of the difference. This is dialect density. I learned this to the 20th power in Georgia. So <laughs> dialect density was something we were talking about at Michigan before I got here. Then I came here where dialect is king. We have Southern, we have Appalachian, we have African American English, and so kids are coming to school using a lot of dialect. Turns out that's quite important for reading. So when we look at dialect density, we quantify dialect use, and we talk about dialect on a continuum. So some kids are low users, less than half, less than 10% of what they're producing is impacted by dialect at all. There are kids in the middle, and then there are high users, where more than half of what they're saying is impacted by some feature of dialect. Turns out that that is one of the most important factors when we look at how kids are doing with reading for how well they read. Kids who are high dialect users are the ones who are having the most trouble with language, uh, with reading and writing. And the way that our colleagues talk about this is linguistic distance. It's another way to talk about dialect density. How far is the child's spoken language away from the written language that they are trying to um, read. So if they're using a lot of features of another dialect, they're changing the morphology, they're changing the syntax, they're probably, some of the, the meanings are changing, they're changing a lot with their own system, and so they're having a lot of trouble getting to the text. That's linguistic distance. So dialect density, we found impacts spelling, it impacts reading, it impacts writing. The higher you are on that continuum, the harder it is to get to text. What does that mean you're not going to read? No, but you sure need more time to get there. You need more trials to get there. You need more practice to get there. You need more attention to the way that your oral language is impacting your reading output. You need for teachers to be more aware that this is influencing what you're doing. And we found that it matters for language. So this is the test of language development uh, sentence processing. This is no dialect. There aren't very many of them. And this is high dialect. The higher the dialect goes, the more kids we have below the reference line who are struggling with understanding sentences. That's oral language. And, oops, we see the same thing for reading, grade one through five. The more dialect you're using, zero to 80 to 100, the more you are struggling with, this is the passage comprehension subtest on the Woodcock-Johnson. So having more trouble with the comprehension of passages. And as a caveat, the question for us is, are they really having trouble comprehending the passages? 
or are they having trouble answering the questions? That's something we don't know. That's that competence versus performance issue. Are they really not getting the concepts or can they not answer the questions because they had so much work to do to get to the answers? And so that is, you know, a question for us now. So, you know, dialect density turns out to be really important. We don't do anything without considering density. And in fact, I'm really only focused on high density kids now because it's not speaking a dialect that makes you struggle with reading. Because if it did, there wouldn't be a reader in this room. It is the, where you are on that continuum of dialect use that matters for how well you read and how long it takes you to get to reading. Many of those kids will become good readers with more attention, but it takes more attention and understanding that this is an issue. So this is our cognitive load issue. I'm gonna talk about cognitive load because I think the way we teach reading to African-American kids increases the cognitive load for them. So this is our poor guy who, here's the intrinsic load, this is, okay, this is what I need to know. This is all the crap we give you on top of that until you fall apart and you can't hold it up anymore. And this is, if we were teaching what kids really needed to know and really focused on that instead of all the extraneous stuff, we might have readers. And some of it is the way we teach reading. And so we're talking a lot now about translanguaging as opposed to, we talked about code switching a lot, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. But translanguaging is an approach to reading. It allows kids to connect their previous experience to new learning. And in this case, it allows them to connect their previous language, their community language system, to the current system that they're trying to use to read. Because what we were doing, what we've been doing, and we're still doing, is trying to extinguish African American English as soon as the kids show up in the classroom. And what I'm saying is, instead of erasing, we need to think about extension. So kids know what they know, and they are experts in their language system when they show up in school. We need you to learn some new things, not get rid of what you know. We need you to use what you know to learn the new things that you need to learn. And so we have to think about how to do that, given that we have so much bias against this system. So it's possible to help kids learn the classroom variety without all these negative messages about African American English. But the challenge is to balance the need to respect with helping them gain facility in the classroom language. I wasn't born yesterday. I know that kids need to learn the language of the classroom. It's going to impact their success not only with reading, but overall academically. They need to learn it. The question is how? How do we teach kids how to read and still affirm what they know about language and help scaffold them toward the use of the classroom language in their educational career. It does not mean extinguishing. So we talk about code switching. Who knows what code switching is? Okay, yes. So one of the things we know about our middle income kids is most of them can code switch because of the experiences they have. So in schools, code switching involves switching or shifting from your community language system to GAE, just making a wholesale shift. Well, a lot of kids can't do that. And the more dialect that a child uses, the more likely they are to be unable to make a wholesale shift. Our middle income kids do it because they learn it inside and outside of school. Many kids who are low income learn it in school, but not out of school. When I was growing up, my mother was, um, she was the minister of music at our church, and our minister lived next door. So they were friends. So I would hear her on the phone. She said, yes, yes. Oh, yes, yes. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes, on Sunday, I think we're going to start with Precious Lord. Then she would hang, and I was standing back thinking, she's talking to Reverend McKinney. Then she would hang up and answer the phone. Mm-hmm. Oh, girl, yes. Uh-huh. I don't know what you're planning to do, but I'm like, oh, that's Susie. <laughs> and so I learned early that my mother changed the way she used language based on who she was talking to and what the context was. So she used it differently at home than she did at church, than she did at her friend's house, than she did in other spaces. And so I learned to make those switches by listening to her. 
And a lot of kids don't, but in this model of code switching, what we've been doing is encouraging kids to suppress a variety in favor of the other one, which is considered more appropriate for school. And I think that for kids who use a lot of dialect, this is a problem for them because they're using so much energy on this sort of suppression that they're not learning a lot about how to use language to support reading. So children, why do you need to code switch? Making the switch makes you a better reader, writer, and speller. It really does. Kids who don't are usually behind their peers in language-based skills, and general American English is a better match to print. And that's where we're trying to get kids to. I am not trying to change the way you talk, the way your mama talks, the way your grandmother talks. I'm trying to teach you to read, and that's where my focus needs to be. And when we tell kids your language is bad and it's ungrammatical, and it's coming from their community, you are telling them your grandmama don't know how to talk, your mama, nobody in your family, and that is not a good message. And it is not the message that is gonna get kids to embrace school. Because you've told them they aren't good enough. That's what I learned from the students at Georgia State. So translanguaging, this came from bilingualism. So there's a woman at uh, NYU, Ophelia Garcia, who has been really pushing, and Ophelia is spelled with an F. She has been really pushing, trying to use translanguaging in schools so for bilingual kids. So trans means across, language, across languages. Translanguaging includes code switching, but it differs in how we relate to kids and how kids are using these two languages to make sense of information. So children learn to use both of their languages in order to maximize understanding naturally and performance in home, wherever they are. So translanguaging, when we're using it in the classroom, allows kids to use their full linguistic repertoire. It doesn't say suppress that and only use this. You know, I say this all the time, but you know Louisa Motes has, has that book, Teaching Reading is Rocket Science. So what we want kids to do, I want you to learn rocket science in a language that you don't even speak. Instead of using the one that you know to learn rocket science and moving toward the one we're trying to teach you. And so this is, we want them to use their full linguistic repertoires. And I often use South Africa as an example because they do this with teaching language. You get to use whatever language you need to. When I went into classrooms, I thought it was because teachers didn't speak good English, but I realized what they were doing. They're teaching photosynthesis, right? First of all, there's no word for photosynthesis in Zulu. So when we say photosynthesis, we use English. But it's also a hard concept. So the harder the concept, the more likely it was that the teacher would switch to the community language and then she would come back. And I realized that they were doing things that were really intentional in teaching. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm not asking you to walk into a classroom, my wonderful white teachers, and use African American English. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is to recognize when it occurs and think about how you're responding to it. So here's an example of a writing sample from a child who was, I think, in fourth grade. See how he's mixing dialect? So one day, me and my mom was at home because we was about to go out. And you see he deleted past tense ED, the S's, the D's, the S's, and had messed up three times. And so he's mixing it. But I want him to write. In the same way that we talk about invented spelling, we don't correct your spelling because we want you to write, let him write. And so what I did was I went where he used African American English. In blue, I put the general American English equivalent. And he can look at that and see that we're moving toward, I want you to keep writing and we're moving toward you being able to write the way you currently write and also write this way. So that we're moving toward the um, classroom standard in writing. And these samples are from Detroit. It's something that they're doing in their schools now. And in this way, we're not asking students to give up their strongest system for a weaker one. Use your strong system. I want you to write. I can see your sentence structure is good. I can see your vocabulary is good. I'm telling you, when we push kids to use 
the standard. The writing is horrible. It's something Geneva Smitherman used to say. They give up all the creativity and the ideas. When I was at Georgia State, I was working with Cynthia Peranic, and she was looking at some of my writing samples. And they were all using the test of written language. And it was this little girl who was perfect um, general American English writing. The boy was sitting. The woman was running. The car was red. She was in fourth grade. If I saw that in oral language, I would say she had a language disorder because there, were, there was no complex syntactic structure. Well, then there was the boy who did not care about whether the writing was um, general American English or not. And his, the same picture started with, it's a whole bunch of stuff going on in this picture. And then he just went for it. But it was this great, really rich language sample because we didn't constrain the way he used language. And so he learned how to write, he learned how to be creative and take chances with his writing because he wasn't focused on the structure. We will teach him the structure, but right now we want you to write. Let kids write. So translanguaging challenges these ideas that a bilingual or bidialectal child is learning to switch between two languages. And what we know instead is that kids have one unitary linguistic repertoire and they're learning how to use them in different spaces. And if we give them the opportunity to have spaces where they have to use them and give them the opportunity to do it, I promise you they will learn it. You do not have to force them to give anything up. So Ophelia Garcia calls it constant adaptation of linguistic resources in the service of meaning making. I want to, I'm running out of time, so. Okay, there's something I wanna show you. Okay, this is a paper we have in press. And um, this is me and um, Ryan James, who's here, and Carla Stanford, whom some of you know, who used to be here at REAP. This is Carla. I put this in, in, in an article because this is the way she teaches and I love it. So she, this is, remember I talked about final consonant deletion? So the teacher says, I'll say the word, tap the sounds and use the word in the sentence. The word is gold. The child says goal. And the child says, wait, are you saying gold like a leprechaun finds gold or is this like I scored a goal? Which one did you say? And the teacher says, what a great question in noticing. You're becoming a word detective. Goal and gold are very similar and only have one sound that makes them completely different words. But what I like is her reflection. This child realized and articulated that the missing sound mattered for word meaning. This interaction was a pivotal point for me as a teacher. I began actively seeking knowledge about AAE in order to better teach my children gain a full understanding of the features of AAE and intentionally connect AAE to GAE in print for my students. That's what we want all teachers to do. She recognized that it was an issue. She went out and learned about the child's language system and she connected the two systems for the child. And her kids get it as a result because she helps them make the connections between the language that they're using and the ones that um, she's trying to teach them. So this is in the journal, The Reading Teacher. And when it comes out, it, we put a lot of lesson plans in it to show you how to do this in reading, in writing, and in spelling. And it's paying attention to which things that your kids are doing that um, represent their home and community language system, how those relate to what you're trying to teach phonologically, morphologically, syntactically, and helping kids make the connections. Not extinguishing the community language in favor of print, but helping them make the connections between their two systems. That's what translanguaging is. It affirms what kids already know, says what you know is valuable, let me show this other stuff I want you to know and then teach them the new things that you want them to know.